Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christ is among us. You know, those that were here last week, we talked a little bit about the progression, if you will, of the Great Lent. About how, even though we think of it as an entire season of repentance, which it is, the way in which the readings progress had a particular logic, if you will, to them. We start out really with the Sundays of joy. We start out with Sundays where we talk about the triumph of the church, where we talk about great and wonderful things, where we talk about St. Gregory Calamus and the way that he upheld the Orthodox belief and the way that we do things. And then we go finally in the middle of Sunday to the Sunday of the veneration of the cross. We have this, and then, and then we begin, if you will, to get serious, I mean more serious. Last weekend we heard the, we heard, uh, we heard the story as far as this, this problem that, that there was with sin. And he talked about, and we heard that gospel reading. And then whereas last Sunday we heard about how sin must be overcome, today we hear about how sin, in fact, is overcome. We hear an inspiring and an amazing story. You heard it before liturgy this morning, the story of St. Mary of Egypt and the way in which she had, she had this lie which I hasten to add is not that unusual in this day and age. She had this life, and she came to such depths of repentance that now, what have we long, 1,500 years later, we remember her as one of the greatest saints of the church, period, of any kind. And what we see in the story of St. Mary of Egypt is it's a how-to, right? Whereas last Sunday we, we kind of talked about that theoretically with St. John Climacus. Now, today, we hear about this woman who in her life and in her actions and in, in the way in which she lived and reacted to her own sin, she shows us the way to repentance. She's an amazing woman. She's an incredible person. And what we learn from St. Mary of Egypt is simply an incredible thing. Well, now, having heard earlier today about this unusual and truly magnificent woman, we now, today, hear about some magnificent apostles who are not so magnificent. And it, then we have to start thinking about how do we approach God? How do we view ourselves? How do we look at our own sin as opposed to the sin of other people? And this is something that I think is very important. You know, first of all, as far as the sin of St. Mary of Egypt, as I said, I think in this day and age, an awful lot of people, both men and women, have gone through parts of their life where they acted in much the same way as St. Mary of Egypt. Details differ, right? But I, most people have some part of their life that they're not all that proud of, for one reason or another. And that's true regardless of sex. So we have this issue with St. Mary of Egypt, who becomes a person who is open and who comes to this realization, this, this divine realization, if you will, of the way in which she lives and the problem that it is for her. And she responds, right? A lot of times people will go, okay, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But St. Mary not only resolved to do better, she took herself out of the arena, out of the place in which these patients were present for her. And so she goes into the desert. That's obviously the most dramatic way which we have that. It's a very dramatic way. It's a sin we all look at and go, yeah, yeah, that's sin. That's sin. <laughs> But then in the gospel reading, what we hear is from the apostles themselves, because the apostles themselves, in ways that sometimes, you know, people will look at this and they, they won't find it praiseworthy, but they'll be like, yeah, I can see that. The apostles, two of the apostles come to Jesus and they go, hey, you'd like to be on your right hand, your left hand? How about that? What do you think? We're good, aren't we? We're, we're fit for that. And Jesus is very gentle with it. He really is. And he doesn't say, just get the kids out of here. Instead, he, he acknowledges that they are apostles, if you will, but makes it clear that this is not what is anything that is set aside for them. But what we do know is that while it's set aside for somebody else, whoever that might be, and whoever it is, is going to be fully worthy. There's no question about that. What then happens is this, is that the other apostles hear about this, 
And they're, they're pretty peeved about it, right? I mean, when you go behind all your friends or the people you're supposed to be equal with, and then you go and you try a special favor or you try and claim some honor or something of the sort, it's not going to do anything but upset the people that are also there with you and are more or less your equals. Give or take, I'm sure that you know, there's kind of a hot cookie, but, but it's more or less the truth. So you see, there are different kinds of sins. Some, like in the case of St. Mary, are just pretty, I mean, they're overwhelmingly obvious, right? Other sins, and often we see this, or more than that, not only do we see it, but we commit these ourselves. Is where we, we compare ourselves to somebody. And we think, you know, pretty good. <laughs> I'm probably a little better than that person. Oh, heck, I'm a whole lot better than that person. <laughs> and we do that, and we don't like to admit that, and we don't like, to, we're not so bald about it, right? But we do, we kind of have this notion. And in a lot of ways, this is the most devastating kind of sin actually within the church, right? Because it becomes this kind of thing where in, in if you will, glorifying ourselves by implication, if not by actual word or deed, we are, we are kind of downgrading other people. And so we might have some notion within ourselves that we're deeply spiritual, that we have spiritual gifts, that whatever, 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 and we may tell ourselves this, it may even be true. But the truth of the matter is, is that when we make comparisons, we, we, at that point in time, we are committing sin because we are downgrading, if you will, our brothers and sisters. So when we have these two apostles that come to Jesus and say this, we, they should have known that. And we know they're really excellent apostles. We, we got no complaints about these guys. Jesus didn't have any complaints about these guys. But the way in which sometimes we aggrandize ourselves is bad. The way in which we sometimes act that we 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 knock ourselves down or we live on a on a kind of a subhuman or an animal level, that's bad. But there's a there's a there's a middle way. There's a way that, in fact, is the way of the saints, the way in which people live. You know, St. Mary, when she went into the desert, this is in my favorite line out of all of this, is where she says the first 17 years were the hardest. That's a long time. And all during those 17 years, I guess, if we, you know, if we, if we understand this correctly, Whatever temptations it was that she was falling to when she was living in the world, they continued to assail her. And the temptation to commit these sins was with her. And you can only imagine that there were many times when she would look up, she'd stand up and look over toward the Jordan River in the direction of it and go, I can go back. I can go back and I can live again in the way in which I was used to. When this temptation, when this urge, when this, this addiction, if you will, overcame her. Think about her for a little bit. I mean, just in a, in a, in a general kind of way. Here's this woman living on her own in the desert, caring for herself, or with God's care for her, actually. There's nobody there with she said later on, tells Osmus, that she had not seen a human being since the day she crossed the Jordan River. And at that time, I think that was 47 years later, but <clears throat> my math may be wrong, but it was a long time. By herself. Had not seen a soul. And she's on her own in the desert. And this is the way in which she dressed. The way her repentance was expressed. And so, she is, the, she is a person who understood innately, inherently, that there is more to repenting than simply going, gosh, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. That there is more to repenting than simply saying, well, I guess I made a few mistakes. But that repentance is in fully, it engages all, all parts of you. And it's, it's, it is absolutely and unflinchingly honest with ourselves. There's no justification.
education. There's nothing that's where we find some way to say to ourselves, well, yeah, it was kind of bad, but it wasn't that bad. And it wasn't as bad as that other person. Remember her, she was even worse than I was. So we have these, these differences. Well, we see the same kind of thing in the second gospel reading we had today, which was, which was out of Luke. It had to do with a woman who anointed Jesus' feet, right? A woman who, who washed her feet with his feet with her hair. And this is another, we don't know that much about her, but she also had this depth of repentance, which far exceeded that, if there was any at all, of the, of the Pharisee. But as far as he was concerned, I mean, everything was good, except for this woman, who shouldn't have been there. And what is she doing anyway? And Jesus makes it clear that, that of these people that are there, that she is the one who is to be honored, if you will. She is the one who has found her repentance, who publicly expresses her sorrow by going to the person who is taking her sorrow away. You see, sin is a very, it's, it's a very deadly, well, you know that, it's deadly, but it's pernicious. It is, it is something that sometimes it slaps us in the face and sometimes it creeps up on us and we start committing sin even though we think we are committing virtue. Just like the apostles did, just like people that sometimes uh, sometimes you read about these stories of monks in the monastery who reach these high levels of spirituality and they become so proud of themselves that they fall prey to delusion. So what does it look like to live a life, a middle life? What does it look like to have a life where we pursue holiness and where what we are pursuing is not so much to be, you know, on the one hand, we want to defeat our sin, and on the other hand, we don't want to become judgmental or proud or whatever the case may be. What does that life look like? Well, Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, who was a Russian bishop in, uh, in London for a long time, he once said, he said, what if you do this? Imagine this. He said, what if you were to go to church one day, but you didn't stop outside the door of the church? And you ask yourself the question that St. Mary had to ask herself, which is, am I worthy to go into the church? Am I worthy to go into the temple of God? <clears throat> and the truth of the matter is, for all of us, myself included, is that we're really honest with ourselves, maybe, maybe not. Because there's always something. There's always something that we haven't dealt with. There's always something that we have not brought to ourselves, that we have not treated honestly, or that we have done to other people or thought about other people, or un unrightly thought about ourselves. This is really an important thing. It's an important thing to understand and to know. And the reason for this is because we can never look at anybody outside of ourselves judge them. And this is exactly why. Because we never, or almost never, honestly judge ourselves. A priest that I know once gave, somebody said, well, what does it look like to be living peacefully, to be living without sin? What does that look like? What will people see? And he said, people won't see anything. <clears throat> to have a Christian life, and to live reasonably and honestly, is like the blue sky. It's not the dramatic clouds, it's not the clouds, the cumulus clouds, the stormy clouds, the wind, the rain, it's the blue sky that is there. It doesn't really call out to you, it doesn't say, I'm dramatic, it's there. But he said to live without sin, to live rightfully and righteously, is like the deeps of the sea. It's not like the surface of the sea where the waves are high and they're crashing and there's storms and they carry on and there's always some kind of movement on there. But it's the deeps of the sea where these things, this agitation, never comes. You can see what he's saying. If we are righteous, it is not that we are going around patting ourselves on the back. It's not that we go around judging other people. Instead, we are content to rest in God. On the other hand, we are sinful. <clears throat> Unlike the Pharisee, right? Some others we know. 
If we are sinful, we focus on ourselves. We don't focus on other people. That's for somebody else to worry about. So there's a fine line, if you will. And St. Mary of Egypt shows us that line. You notice the things she, she did not say in talking to Zosima. She did not say, oh, I ran around with a bunch of women. We were all like that. Or there was so and so. She was worse than I was. There's none of that. There's no justification. There's no comparison. There's no looking at others around you and saying, well, at least I'm not like that. You did that Pharisee, right? So we don't do that. We focus on ourselves and we are honest with ourselves. And when we do that, like St. Mary of Egypt, God will show us how, how to cleanse ourselves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be glory to Jesus. Amen.